Welcome to the Charlie Paparelli Show. I'm Charlie Paparelli. Uh, we publish these episodes of Entrepreneurs Helping Entrepreneurs every Friday. If you don't want to miss an episode, I recommend you go to paparelli.com and just submit your email and you will be on the list. Um, I have been an angel investor in the greater Atlanta area for the last 25 plus years. And during that time, I've met hundreds of entrepreneurs and I've learned from these entrepreneurs how to start companies and how to build great companies. And this is what we're about here in the Charlie Paparelli show. I interview entrepreneurs, they tell their stories and, uh, it, it, in the end, always helps entrepreneurs start companies and build great companies. Hopefully, this will be an encouragement for you, too. Our topic today is the 40-year startup, a life of discovery. And my guest is Marty Tyne, who is the founder of Donnelly & Company. I met Marty by being, I was introduced to him by Frank Tye, who is the uh, senior entrepreneur and resident at residents at the Atlanta Technology Development Center at Georgia Tech. And when I went over there, I in meeting Marty, it was a great experience. Marty founded a call center called Donnelly and Company. And uh, what struck me was three things. One, his relationship with his employees on how it was like, even though he's been in business for so long and his business had gotten so large, it was like he only had those first three employees. Everybody was his friend. The other is the brands that he attracted, consumer brands to die for, for any business. If you, when you see the list, you'll know we talk about the consumer brands that he attracted. And we'll talk about how to get those consumer brands and also his faith. He actually had a chapel in his office. I had never seen that before. And I'm looking forward to him explaining how that all kind of came about. But he is also, what's unique about Marty is he is the founder of Donnelly & Company, but he never took on the title of founder or CEO or president, which uh, was you'll find to be pretty unique, he used in a very unique way. And then lastly, he's a true entrepreneur, entrepreneur from the, from the word go, sacrificed everything for it because that was the calling that God had for him, I'm sure. And he is a man of deep faith. So, Marty, we welcome you. I'm glad that you're here to join me. Thank you, Charlie. It's my pleasure to be here. And I look forward to talking to you. Yeah, well, this is going to be a lot of fun. You know, I was wondering, we can start. People are always wondering how people become entrepreneurs. And I was wondering if you could share, what was your life like around that time that you decided that you were really going to step into this business that you uh, eventually created? Uh, Charlie, I was in college. Uh, my, my grandfather had a business. My father had a business. My brother had a business. So it wasn't, <laughs> it wasn't a one-off to maybe consider uh, starting a company. I was in college. I was 19 when I started thinking about it. And I went home to tell my dad. And he said, stay in school where you belong. <laughs> and I'm a father of someone that age, and I would give the same advice. But my, but my mother heard my idea and said, well, that's clever. Maybe that would work well. And uh, so I left school after my sophomore year to begin this company. No kidding. And it was I'm a surprise. And your mother and you, what did your mother say about you leaving school? She, I just said, you know, I'll leave for a little bit, make some money and then go back to school with, uh, you know, be able to cash flow my life with this little business as I uh, finish my degree. And unfortunately, Charlie, 40 years later, I still haven't gone back. <laughs> but that's OK. I think you told me that uh, I think you went to the University of Alabama. I did. Yeah. And uh, when I first got the idea, I went to there was a building called the Bid Good Building in Tuscaloosa. And I met with a marketing professor and he said, oh, that's a really good idea. And I didn't know it, but when I left school, he started a competitive company with the idea, and he lasted about three or four years, I understand. You know, that's crazy. I, I've had entrepreneurs, and I have other angels who've told the same story. Is sometimes entrepreneurs come to us, and they say, I want you to sign an NDA, you know, so that, you know, uh, you don't steal my idea. And I learned from a VC, he said to me, look, I'm in the business of investing in ideas. I'm not in the business of executing on ideas. 
And so I've never heard a story where someone actually stole the idea. This is the first time I've heard it. Charlie, I, I didn't know it at the time. I didn't know what an NDA was, and I probably <laughs> wouldn't have cared. It's a huge market. There's such a vast market for what I was doing that it wouldn't have mattered anyway. Well, where did the, so when you're in college, one of the things that's hard to do is when you're in college, you don't know business very well. So to come up with an idea for business is something that I haven't really heard from a lot of people. Most of the time, what I hear from college students today, as you could well imagine, is social network type stuff, right? Those kind of ideas, because that's where they're sort of, that's the life that they live at that point. But you started, you came up with an idea for business. Am I right? Is it was it a business yeah. idea? Well, it there's a couple things that happened. Um, I had a girlfriend in Detroit. I had worked there in the summer, and the long distance bill was really expensive. So I thought, why don't I get a toll free number in the fraternity house? I lived in a fraternity house, <laughs> and let everybody use the phone, and I would charge because back then toll free numbers were very very expensive. And I thought well, I would long share distance the was very very expensive. I remember that, you know exactly. So I would share the number. I never ended up doing that. But then we went down to spring break to Florida, to Panama City with all my buddies. I brought a Navy blazer and they brought chests of beer and, uh, <laughs> and their bathing suits. And during the day, I was, you know, 20. I was knocking on doors, talking about taking brochure requests and reservations for condominium places down in Florida. And those were my first accounts the Sandpiper Cove and some of those other. But what was the, when you said like you're in sophomore year and at the University of Alabama, what was the idea? What was the, and, and where did the idea even come from? Well, I think I might've read an article in like U.S. News and World Report about the, the explosion of toll-free numbers. Okay. And w when I tried to make reservations for Florida, they didn't have toll-free numbers. They, they you had to call long distance. So just a combination of that is why don't I start a, um, a, a business where I got a toll free number and I took calls for people and I didn't know what the outcome would be. You know, I could, couldn't see 40 years forward, but it was just provide a service via toll free number um, where an individual company couldn't maybe afford toll free numbers back then, but I could do it. I could share the cost over many people. I, other than that, I can't tell you that's that's kind of the nugget of how it started. So that was just basically that that was the idea is to share a toll for the cost of a toll free number. Right. That was the initial kind of. All right. And so you did start. it with you did it at the fraternity house. Well, I was going to do it at the fraternity house, but I, I didn't actually do it. But that was the idea. And then when I went to Florida, they were very interested. These condominium projects were very interested. And then I rolled from that into the minute. Friday. Wait, 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 wait a minute. Let me, let's go back. You're going a little too fast. So you sure. said the, the condominium projects were interested. How did you know about condominium projects? You're, well, uh, you're yeah. 20 years old. Yeah. You're a sophomore yeah. in college. Come on. We were trying to get a hotel room or for the, at the beach with my fraternity brothers. Okay. And, you, and they didn't have toll free numbers because they were expensive back then. And so I thought when I went down there, I would ask them, would, would they be interested if I could send brochures on their condominium and take reservations? And it was just an idea. And I had a brochure printed in Tuscaloosa. My, my sister gave me an $800 loan. And I just <laughs> thought I just thought I would try. I thought, you know what? Will the dogs eat the food? If I come up with this idea and could execute it, would they be interested? And so, who surprising, you, so, so who do you go to? So this is, again, this step by step. I mean, okay, so now you have this idea of condominiums. Like you're trying to make I reservations. Had, who do you go to? I had, a little, I had a little brochure and I put my blazer on and I knocked down the door and said, hey, I'd like to talk to somebody in the marketing or in the sales department. Okay. And I sat across the table and I handed them my brochure about toll-free answering and, and brochure requests. And they, they were interested. And, and they literally were my first accounts. <laughs> what was it? Do you remember those first conversations? Uh, pretty much. And then also on Fridays. So what did they, the say? they said. They said. There's this young kid and there you are talking about, hey, I want to let me talk to you about 800 numbers. And uh, the problem that I had trying to make a reservation with you guys. Right. That, that, that was kind of the story. And I said, we'd love to try it. And in. And, and, uh, love to provide this service, but we're not starting until like July or August. I didn't have an actual 
phone number or anything working other than this little brochure that I printed. So you didn't invest in anything. You didn't, you borrowed the 800 bucks for what reason? You didn't need the 800 bucks to print a brochure, did you? Yeah, I, it was a color brochure, a fold open. It was, it was pretty nice. <laughs> <laughs> What did you have? Did you have a girlfriend design it or did you design it or did uh, you have one of your fraternity brothers design it? I mean, how did it come about? I, I did have a friend. She she helped do a logo and and, and I looked at uh, something, other things in the market. It, it You know, I still have one somewhere, but it was that that's what I used as my entree to get a sit down with someone. And so the pitch, wanted, your pitch was let me you publish this 800 number. On your brochures, right? And to no, travel they would, it. What? They would publish it in their brochures in, in the Wall Street Journal or wherever they advertised. I would answer the phone in a generic way. Thank you for calling this. Uh, uh, <laughs> would you like to receive a brochure? And we had an extension number. Because this is before caller ID. Way before caller ID. Yeah. And it was a, and it was a, you had one 800 number. Yep. I okay. had a single for everybody. Number. For everybody. Okay. It would, and they would print an extension in the ad, extension 800. And I would say, thank you for calling uh, Snowshoe Mountain, West Virginia. This is Martin. May I help you? And I would physically write down the calls, the, the address and the phone number and all of that. And then I would type them up on a uh, selectric typewriter. And I, would, I call them computer reports. I would put green bar paper into a typewriter like it was came off a computer. And then I would mail those reports to the company. But when somebody yeah. called, you would say, what extension are you calling? Well, they would typically give the extension or say, may I have the extension number, please? And they would say extension 400. And we would say, uh, thank you for calling the Sandpiper Cove in Destin. <laughs> How may I help you? And then I would scribble down in a little notebook, their name and address. And well, all then that help stuff. me with this. Since you were taking, you were, you were basically taking reservations. Uh, at that time, we were just taking brochure requests. Oh, brochure. That makes sense to me, okay? Because you don't have any. I mean, this is all manual. So oh, you totally said there, manual. it's not like you could look up and say, we have, you know, the week of, you know, June 7th available, right? So you just do right, a brochure right. request. Yeah, yeah. And Charlie, at this time, the, I, the Apple just came out and I got an Apple II computer with a 16K extended RAM card and one five and a quarter inch floppy. Well, that, what did you that, do with it? They were dumb as dirt. The only thing you do is play games on them. What did you do with it? There was a software program called DB Master. And right. I, had, I had it set up to take name, address, city, state. And, and it would say question one, two, three, four, five. And in my little book, question one was their age. Question two for this company was their phone number. Question, they didn't have email addresses back then. Maybe their fax number. And then... Uh, uh, the other extension would have what those five questions were for that company. It was very, very manual. So what was it? So how do you, how do you decide what to charge for something like that? What was your pitch? I mean, well, I well, knew what do it Do you would, remember? <laughs> yes. Yes, I do. My rates compared to today were very high back then. It was like a dollar 14 a minute. I charged by the minute of transaction. Or I would do a fixed cost depending on how many questions they had. But what that led to is every time they changed the script or what they wanted, I would have to say, okay, that means it's 15 cents more a call. And I was nickeling and diming, diming them. So I typically went what, with what, a... And uh, what were you paying for a minute of 800 service? About 30 cents a minute back then. Okay. 30, so you were making 30, about 30. 80 to 90 cents in gross margin every minute. Right. Je but obviously there was labor and all the yeah, other stuff. Yeah, you got to pay. Yeah, and then you're paying labor. But, do, but what was your hourly labor rate back then? Oh, baby. 40, 40 years ago, it might have been 5 or $6 an hour. Well, how and much we were, 40 years ago is what? 19 what? 81 when we started. 81. So that must have been an – I bet you that the – I think – and talking to one of your contemporaries in 1985, he told me that his minimum wage was 3.65 an hour. So you were probably at three bucks an hour. Some somewhere around there, it, <laughs> I think it, it might have been four or five. Because in Anniston, Alabama, you couldn't get good diction for four dollars. I had to pay a little <laughs> bit more to get, you know, pretty clear diction. So you even started this business in Anniston, Alabama. You oh sure my did. God. 
And it was there for four or five years before we moved to Atlanta. So who people did you start? Say, so you called on, you first called on these people when on spring break. So you went to all of the condominium owners, right? If you will, right. or the, or the um, management companies, right? Right. Then what did you, how did you kind of move from there? So when you got back, well, you had a first thing you had to do is get an 800 number. Right. So, so I got the 800 number and I got it working and I staffed it 24-7, 365 for 40 years. The first seven years, Charlie, I was the first, second and third shift. I literally <laughs> would wake up out of a dead sleep. Good morning, may I help you? Um, OK, would you like a, a L.L. Bean? Would you like a brochure? OK, we'll send you our new catalog. Name, address, city, state, zip. And I'd go right back to sleep. Phone would ring. And I had one of those clapper devices that turned the light on in my room so that I could wake up and see. And then so, so, sometimes I couldn't even see what I wrote. So I started recording the calls. So in case I couldn't read, I could hear the recording. One of those little sponge things that go on a telephone that Radio Shack back 40 years ago. Oh, yeah, yeah, right. So that's how I can. But so the condo projects were my first so then I started looking in the Wall Street Journal on Fridays. They have a real estate section. And so Snowshoe Mountain, West Virginia had uh, condominium projects, Beaver Creek, Colorado, uh, all of these. Uh, on one page in the Wall Street Journal, I might have six clients with six different extension numbers. So I started building the clients. Really? Okay, let me ask you this. What were they doing up until then? You're saying they, they, didn't, have, all, they didn't have 800 numbers. They did not. When I started, LL Bean did not have a toll-free number. It was okay. called 207 number. Okay. And so basically, you would write a letter. They'd have the address, or you'd call them long distance. And that was a barrier. They'd run an ad, and the real cost was the advertising. And if I could generate my, my, my opening pitch was, I'm looking at your ad in the Wall Street Journal, and I see that you don't have a toll-free number. And this was an AT&T statistic. I said, do you realize that if you had a toll-free number in this ad, you could get 67% more inquiries for this one ad? <laughs> and that was the pitch, that you could get more leads per ad. And so your overall cost was lower, even though you're paying me to take your phone call. But if I'm, so, if I'm, if I'm L.L. Bean, right. why didn't I just say, you know, you're right, uh, kid. I should get my own 800 number. Well, that, that was, that's a good question. They figured this. It was a qualifier. Some people would tell me when I'm calling them, well, if I put a toll-free number in there, all I'm going to get is tire kickers. I want people that are serious. <laughs> okay, you're going to qualify your leads by making it difficult to get a hold of you, but your real cost is the, the 100000 you spent in advertising last month. So it took, in the beginning, it took a while to let people understand you don't qualify by making it difficult to get a hold of you. I, th I think I said to one guy, I said, um, so if you made them write via England and then they got you, that would really qualify. Anybody that would go through that would be really qualified. It would just to reduce it to the ridiculous. That Yeah, right. You don't just qualify by making it difficult. Does that make you sense? You know, that's interesting because today everything is in startups is about reduce friction, reduce friction, reduce friction, make it easy, 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 easy. Right. Absolutely. And uh, even to the point where, you know, you got 90 day money back guarantees. That's what we started with. And then you got into use it for 30 days, you know, but you have to give your credit card. Now it's use it for 30 days. Don't give me your credit card because people didn't want to put their credit card. In. So back right. then, they said, oh, yeah, the guy had to qualify himself because he had to spend at least the cost of long distance to call me. Right. <laughs> that was that was some of the thinking out there. I love it. Well, I was probably a victim and I was probably part of that thinking. You know, I remember being in business back then. I don't think we had an 800 number until probably the uh, early 80s uh, because we were doing so many marketings and had so, so much marketing and had a lot of inbound leads. That's cool. So how do you – so – so just for a second, let's kind of go off for a second and just talk about a little sure. bit about your family. Sure. All right. So back then. So what was your family like back then, your family background for you to, at 20 years old or 19 years old, decide, I'm going to do this. Father says stay in school, which is what fathers say. And your mother's 
just loved loved you guys so much. It's just like, oh, that's a great idea, Marty. <laughs> you should do it. Yeah. So did she call you Marty or were you Martin? She called me Mart, M-A-R-T. M-A-R-T. Okay. So, you know, big Catholic family, seven kids. Uh, my father and his brother were from Detroit and they moved south to start a sewing plant down in where labor was cheap and the, they did military contracts. And so the forts were down here where they would ship the raw goods. So this I grew down up. down in Aniston, I, Alabama, Aniston. Yeah. Okay. So mother and father from Detroit, I was born in, I think I was the, the, the first two or three were born in Detroit, everybody else in the South. Matter of fact, this is the South when my grandmother said, why don't you go home to have the baby to Detroit? Cause you don't want Alabama on the birth certificate. So wow. that, that was, that was, you know, Alabama was Alabama back then. Yeah. <laughs> we were, uh, you know, the bus burnings and all the stuff. This was, you yeah, know. I remember growing up in the Northeast and, and uh, I wound up working in Mobile, Alabama, in fact, at some point. Oh. And I had that same reaction. This was in the, this was 1976 thinking, how can I go to Alabama? You know, that's where the civil rights stuff was going on. And, you know, those riots and all that stuff, because that's right. all we knew about it. You know, that, that's what they experienced, but they, they went on to live their lives in Alabama, then retired to Florida. But the net net is um, my mother believed in us at a level that it's don't know that it's healthy, but she do. She felt we could do anything. So when I was a little kid, she'd say, hey, would you take a look at the dishwasher? It's not working. And I would she's asking me to do it. I'm 13. I don't know a darn thing, but <laughs> you would take the take the lid off and you would see that the timer had fire burns. You know, it, yeah. it was scorched. So you'd call Sears and order the part and it, you screw it in and it's got two wires and, and it would work. And then so she would always like, hey, would you take a look at the TV? It's not working. <laughs> and then even even as a, a very young kid at 12 or 13, she would say, would you help me with this budget? You know, she was balancing the budget. And I think my father gave Were her. Were you weekend. the oldest? No, no. I was uh, five from the top. But I, I, I was kind Why of. Why was she uh, asking you? I, I don't know. I was always kind of uh, capable or, or at least okay. she thought I was capable. And so when I went. Well, the other we thing is you've ne you never said no. No, I, yeah, I didn't say no. Yeah. But she always, she always assumed I could. So I, I said, well, why not give it a try? Wow. So what a great mom. So, so grew up in that world of, and then we didn't have a Catholic high school in our town. And so my parents sent us all to Catholic boarding school outside of New Orleans where fast forward 30 years, I sent my two boys. And so we got the experience of living among the Catholic brothers and that whole, that whole world of faith and action, you know, so. What kind it, of impact did that have on you? Do you think? Pro profound, profound impact. Just. Um, In what way? It just how to live. The brothers were examples we had 300 boarding students and they knew how to handle boys. Some boys needed a little bit of a come to Jesus talk <laughs> and some boys just needed a pat on the head, you know, mm -hmm. but they were very. Uh, and so I, I, I unfortunately was, I was pretty well behaved. So I got a lot of uh, responsibility. I, I had a master key to the school building and I, I made locks uh, I was in charge of Wait counting. All the well, money. How did all that come about? So now instead of your mother asking you to do things, now you got the brothers asking you to do things. What did you uh, have? Like, a, did you wear like a shirt with your name on it or what? I mean, I why, why did people call on you? That, that's probably a, a long trip to the psychologist. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, but there was a brother that ran the school yeah. that either trusted me or liked me because when I was going to go there, they didn't have room in the school. And they told my parents, I'm so sorry, we don't have room. And my mother kept calling all summer saying, do you have room now? No, ma'am, we don't have room, but he can come in October. Do you have room now? No, nope. all summers. They're telling her, no, no, no. Up until the day before school started, I had never been to the school. My brother had already gone there. And so when she went to take my brother to school, she said she packed all my bags, including my bicycle. And I wasn't accepted. And we show up at the school and they said, uh, I'm sorry, Mrs. Ty. I, we told you yesterday there is no room. She said, that's OK. School doesn't start until tomorrow. 
and I'm mad as a snake. You dragged me all the way down here. You How old are you then? Is this where you, is this? Ninth grade, ninth grade. Okay, good. So you're 14 well, years old. Okay. There's a, there's a, there's a lesson in this story. I'm, that's why I'm taking the time. Yeah, no, that, I think it's good. Go ahead. I'm just trying to so put an the, age on it. Yeah. So basically I'm mad. She dragged me down here. They said no room. And I was back in the hotel and she said, well, let's get up and go to mass with the brothers before we leave. You go. I don't want to go. And I want to stay in the hotel. Nonsense. Get up. So <laughs> literally, we are after mass. They had breakfast. We're sitting in the dining room and the director of admissions. Walks up to the table and said, Mrs. Ty, we have an opening. Now, school, it is 730. School starts at eight. I left the I left the dining room table, and I went to um, uh, I went to the office. They gave me a schedule, and I was in the first class on the first day when school started. And I didn't see my stuff get put in the dorm or anything. And I literally st- so that is the kind of faith that that my mother had and uh, modeled for us that really anything is possible. You just pray enough and you are focused enough. And so I learned that at a very early age that you learned to trust God in effect. That's what she would always do. Right. Absolutely. Do you remember what you do? You remember that moment? Yeah. Can't you? When that brother came up and said, we have an opening. Tell me about that moment. You can see it's emotional to me today. Yeah. Little did I know how impactful those four years would be to me. Mm. Um, But just that, you know what? You really can work for what you want and not give up. And that's been a kind of the the whole story of my whole story today is I should have failed 10 serious times, 10 times that most people would not survive. But I just had that from a young age that, it's in God's hands. His will be done. And just until there's just weird, no way. Yeah. The weird thing, too, it? is, is that up until that moment, you were angry and sitting there eating after the mass, you were probably embarrassed. Like, yeah, why, I was. why are we I was. even here? This is stupid. They said they didn't have room. And then, boom, he drops it on yeah. you. Yep. We have an opening. You start in 30 minutes. Yeah, the only one who wasn't surprised was my mother. <laughs> I, I told you and then one other thing I learned in that exchange is that you have to face problems face to face head on and don't hide and don't if you are across the table from someone that's the decision maker and you are sincere forthright honest you can almost always work something out and I learned that in business The times when I should have been just flushed down the toilet that the business cannot survive. I had somebody kind, charitable, and saw the sincerity and the desire and said, okay, I'll do it. Whether it was was a bank loan I didn't deserve, whether it was an extension on uh, the lease or whatever, I never hid. I I never was hard to find. I always answered the phone call. I always read the mail. And I, I thankfully, I when I started my business and I had children, I did, I haven't I don't drink alcohol or and so I always had a clear, rational mind when I was faced with a crisis. Wow. It seems to me, too, I was talking to uh, uh, somebody that was in your young entrepreneurs, Y.E.O. Grew organization, you know, yep. uh, Chip Patterson. Yes. And uh, he was started a business at uh, probably even a a year before you did. Okay, age wise, I think he was 18. You were probably 19. And I I I think it was interesting to me that I think it plays to your advantage to be young like that and actually not talking about building a business, but be in the process of building a business when you meet these big shots. Right. Right. Because. Then they look and they go, look, at this is an enterprising young man. I need to help him, right? I mean, who's going to say, like, what are you doing here, kid, and kick you out? I mean, if you just have an idea, maybe, but if you're in it, 
That's a different story. Well, a couple things, Charlie. My name is Martin Ty, but my family and my friends call me Marty. But when I was 19 and I'm sitting in New York across the table from a decision maker at a big company, I was Martin because it's Billy and Tommy and Marty and Teddy sounded like a kid. <laughs> and then you mentioned earlier uh, in the first 30 years, my business card said VP of marketing. So I didn't have to, I wasn't the decision maker. First of all, they would think, what kind of company is this if a president of a company is 19 or then if they ask me for a price cut or discount, or I would say, I'll just, let me see if I can get it done. You know? <laughs> because you certainly didn't have the authority based on your title, right? Right, right. So it gave me a little bit of, let me think about that for a day before I answer. And how maybe did, not. A, so how right. did all of that, that life experience, you know, prior to starting this company, how did it impact the company in the early years? Can you kind of... Well, Sure. Make a probably of connections there. Probably positively and negatively. Positively, I just had this unwavering sense that I could do it, and then I didn't fear a failure. I didn't want to go back to my father and say, "Hey, Dad, you were right. I should have stayed in school." <laughs> and, I, and actually, my father worked. How many for of us young? How many of us young men were there? We're doing what we were doing to prove our dads wrong, right? <laughs> yeah, or, or to prove that you were right. Yeah, <laughs> uh, and my dad actually worked for me for about ten years. Uh, different uh, proofing and t roles that he had that I was able to help help my parents as well as he was helping the company. That's great. But that was kind of nice. Uh, so, so tell me then, tell me the early years. You know, here you are. You did the condominium thing and all that. You know, tell me about the early years sure. okay, of building this business while you were still in Aniston. Right. So the initial accounts were those condominium projects on the Wall Street Journal that advertised. But who else advertised in the Wall Street Journal was Quick and Riley, the Zweig Forecast, the Value Line Investment Survey, Xerox Financial Services, Insured Municipal Income Trust paying, this is Jimmy Carter days, paying 12% interest rates on, you know, uh, those kind of uh, instruments. Mm -hmm. So I started to get those I broadened into other advertisers in the Wall Street Journal. And one of the biggest wins I got was, early wins, was Value Line Investment Survey. Don't know if you heard of it, but every broker reads it or did read it. And uh, Value Line used Avis Renicar. Avis Renicar outsourced their excess capacity in competition to me. And they had uh, Value Line. But they used to FedEx value line their orders every night in a FedEx envelope. And I took an Okie Data printer and strapped a modem to it, a 300 baud modem in the beginning. And I brought that to their office and I was able to print in, in real time orders that were coming in over this pin fed paper through an Okie Data printer. Yeah. They loved it. They dropped These are Avis, Avis orders? Avis, no, these are Value Line Investment Survey orders performed by Avis Rent-A-Car's call center. They, they were a competitor. Oh, I see what you're saying. Okay. They white labeled it for Value Line. I got it. Okay. So I won that account. And then an ad age, like three months later, tell Avis me again, Rent Tell me again, you won the account because you did, what did you do? We were able to deliver the orders same day instead of a FedEx. Okay. Through a, we transmitted it like a long distance printer. And in, back in 1984, this was not child's play. Okay. You know, it, it, was, it took a little bit of oomph to make it happen. So Avis Rent-A-Car ran in a, 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 a full-page ad in Advertising Age. It was a magazine for the advertising. I don't even know if it's around. It's called Ad Age. I'm sure it is. A Avis introduces the lead machine, and it had a picture of basically what we won the value line account for. And that's when I stopped to think, I'm little me in this little office in Alabama. I think my rent was 300 a month. And Avis Rent-A-Car, the corporation of billions, even probably back then, is responding to me. And it was like, it was a wake-up call that I could so actually- like, I'm a, How can I be a real competitor to a real company, right? Well, then I started figuring out that- Big accounts 
were just as easy as little accounts. And the, 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 the numbers made much more sense. How did you so figure the, that? How did you figure that out? Because of that, because of them being recognized you as a real competitor? Yeah. And then I went to General Motors in Detroit, downtown Detroit. I'm in the GM headquarters and I'm sitting in a room and I did a present. I, I always could do a good presentation. Wait I'm a doing a Tell me how you got that appointment. Just like the old fashioned way, you know, you, you, you make a phone call, you get screened by the screen. Back then they didn't have direct numbers. You always got screened by a secretary. And I just was able to get in the door and I also had a, a bird dog guy that was a brother-in-law. And uh, so we were able to get the meeting. And I remember standing in Detroit, downtown GM, the old, not the Rensen, but the old GM headquarters. I'm doing a pitch in front of 10 General Motors executives. All marketing guys, right? And they're all listening intently. And they said to me after the meeting, we have a presentation to our Saturn division in three weeks. Could you come? and do this same presentation at Saturn in Nashville. And I, I just, I'm thinking, this is GM, the, one of the, probably at the time, the biggest corporation in America. They have more, they waste more in paper supplies than my whole business bills annually. How are they, but I had an overhead projector with a, a back before there were no projectors. You put them on a, uh, an old-fashioned projector from yeah, a school. It was the light box with the projector. Yeah, yeah exactly. right. I got you. So back when they were fifty-two hundred dollars, and I invested in one. So, and you when, carried it up there. And I carried it up there. And GM had me pitch, and we won the business. How old were you? Early twenties. Early twenties. Like 21, 22. I, I, it might have been. Might have been 24, 25. I, I can't quite remember. Because you were still on Aniston. That's why I say that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah okay. So, and then, then I went in, to CBS Magazine. Did you go to Nashville? Yes. Yes. We did the pitch. We won the business. And what we, was we, the, we and what was the, what was the ask? What was the business ask? Uh, this was called, uh, sorry about the uh, grandfather clock. It's going to click. okay. You're good. But, uh, GM had something called NASO, G General Motors North American Service Operation, and they did millions of mail out to the dealers, customers, 10% off an oil change, uh, one year anniversary since you bought the car. And GM NASO did all this marketing on behalf of General Motors. And the dealers didn't fill out all the paperwork very well. They just, I mean, they'd send them a booklet and the service managers are too busy. And they didn't take the time to do it. So GM hired us to call into the service department, database all the information, call them back nine times if we had to in order to get the complete information filled out. And then the marketing programs worked all that much better. And so I remember getting a check for $114,000 for one month from Buick. Now, this is back a little bit before I thought if I could do 100000 a year in total sales, Wow, that would that's when I made my other job was a lifeguard. I made four dollars an hour lifeguarding. So I was thinking if I could do a hundred thousand a year at this business, that would be something else. And I did one hundred thousand in one month from one customer. So that's how far I was off when of did it, when did the way. business move from when like there had to be a point in time. I know there was a point in time because I lived it, okay, which is 800 numbers were just something that you had to have if you were selling right. nationally, right? So exactly. that edge that got you into the problem that started in the business where people thought, oh yeah, I only want qualified leads, so let me have high friction. We went to AT&T selling 800 numbers at more competitive prices, and then there was this adoption of lower friction. Let me get more leads in and I'll qualify them, right? Right. How did your business have to have to sure. so had a pivot right. on that? Because otherwise you were out of business, right? Exactly. I was selling one horse and that was I could give you a toll free number. Now you could get toll free numbers by yourself. Right. And you didn't need me. So it became I bought a Unix computer back when no one knew what Unix was. <laughs> An AT and T three B two one thousand model eighty computer and it was Unix. <laughs> and I learned C Pro I went 
we were just about to move to uh, Atlanta and people would say, we don't want our phone calls answered in Alabama. We're from New York. We, we, our, our client won't go for that. So we thought we'd get a little more sophisticated and move to Atlanta. I got married and moved to New York to do selling. And I had another partner that he was doing the operations and he moved, we moved the business to Atlanta. And that's, that was that move. But more so then the we call started. The center itself was in Atlanta, but the it, sales, you were selling it, out of New York. Out of, a, out of a New York apartment. Matter of fact, right around the corner from my building, I was at 55th between 2nd and 3rd. Yeah. At 903rd was one of my customers. It was just right around the corner. And then we started picking up Quick and Riley Discount Broker, Muriel Siebert, all these uh, New York based clients. And then we started calling on yeah, ad I'm agencies. I'm trying to understand what was it that you were offering them since it oh, wasn't yeah. an 800 okay. number. Tell me what. So, what was the. Uh, we moved into technology in that I could. I learned how to make computers talk to each other. So I could take orders for you and be connected to your computer and insert the orders in real time. And if you were down, I was up. So I am, I, I, I'm not like you would do today. You would just do a VPN and the two companies would be connected. Yeah. I, built, I replicated your database and your system and pricing and all that. And then I would exchange files, uh, sometimes every hour, sometimes every night. And I would take orders and I could insert them into your software. I researched the top 10 software for the industry. And we would write, we would build interfaces between our computer and theirs. And so if they were down, we were up because we weren't reliant on them because we had a copy of all the data. Was that technology not called electronic document interchange? Was that? The was EDI that was... Well, that was one of them. EDI electronic, okay. uh, was one interface, but it really got down to a fixed field, comma delimited. You know, there was a million ways to exchange documents, and we would look at their how situation. You know, how did you know to go into that? I just started studying like a crazy person on IT and infrastructure and database. And so the net net is then all of a sudden we were labor but we were, and then we started focusing on average order value and conversion rate. In my industry, you spend all this money, and, and, and like today, here's the argument today. I don't want to use a call center. I just want to do everything online. That sounds sensible because I can cut out the call center cost. But if my average order value is 10% higher than the internet and my conversion rate is 70% and the, inter rate, the, the internet is 30? Well, then, whether I charge $4 for a call or $9 for a call, there's, I'm so much more powerful than an internet order because I can upsell and cross sell. I can, and if I can prove. So you not so, only have a higher conversion rate, you found out later, but you also have an aver higher average sale. A AOV, average order value. Yep. I've so like, okay. I, got, I got it a customer out in Oregon. And the first bill came out. The first thing I would do is run a report. I get all their data and I would create my own analysis of what their average order value was and their conversion rate. They got my bill and they said, your bill is 20% higher than the, the, than the previous vendor. Why is it so high? And I said, in your first 90 days, I generated uh, $540,000 in more revenue on the same number of transactions as your other competitor. Yes, I charge you 20,000 more, but you got, and I would send them both reports. You got a 20X return. <laughs> they would say, oh, wow, well, okay, I understand. It, the fastest phone call or transaction in the world is, I'm sorry, I can't help you call customer service. I'm sorry, I can't help you call customer service. The Where you build, end up doing billings is, let me look that up for you. Let me find that item for you. Well, we have a matching, we have a, it's Mother's Day and you ordered a robe. Did you know there's a matching pair of slippers on the other page that wasn't on that page? And it goes with that robe. Can I add that to your order? So we could generate revenue. We could hire conversion. And literally, we could. When did all this happen? This year, you're talking. It makes me. I'm thinking like you're talking 2010. You're not talking about 1986. <laughs> uh, probably early 90s or, or, or mid mid to late 80s. Uh, 
So this because. was you were this was something none of the other call centers. Now you have competition. None of the other call centers were doing. They weren't. Matter of fact, Charlie, in the middle of my presentation, I would open up a spreadsheet that was already pre-filled, and I would say, "What is your average order value?" And they'd say, hundred dollars." What's your conversion rate? Oh, 63. And I would show uh, it was to reduce it to the ridiculous again. I would say if a competitor in another column charged you 50 cents a minute and they eroded your AOV by 5% and your conversion rate by 2%, that would end up costing you on an annual basis of the number of orders you said, it cost you a million dollars in lost revenue. If I could improve it by 1% and 1%, They could give it to you for free, and I'm a better deal for you. So the spreadsheet demonstration live was a big part of my sales presentation to those retailers that I could talk about. That's really smart. So you you actually gave them the analytical analysis rather than just doing some little summary or something that says my ROI is better than this ROI, even if it was for free. You showed them that. You put in In the number and you showed your result real time, right? In the, in the, right in the middle of the pitch in that, in that second. And you were exposed for all the criticism, but we could, we could answer. So to answer your original question of how did you go from toll-free numbers had value, we had, to ex- we had to create more value than if they just did it themselves. And then, obviously, uh, disaster recovery. If you're down, we're up. All, all the, re- you know, they don't think about their, having to run their HVAC at night and on the weekends and some buildings don't even turn it on. Uh, you know, they, they hire this. So the reason uh, that you were, the reason I think that part of the reason or the reason that you were really forward thinking like this is that you were the chief sales officer. You were in front of these customers. You were listening to them. You saw what was happening on their site. You saw the problems that they complained about. Right. There was no filter between the market, the guy, the buyer, and the president of the company. And, and Charlie, also, I knew that I learned how to program. I wasn't good by all means. I wasn't good, but I could program and see. I could write shell scripts and reports and RPT and SQL. I knew that stuff inside and out. So I'm in a room and the IT manager says, it, it can't be done. And the president is relying on the IT manager. And I said, yes, it can. I'd be happy to either talk about it now or offline, but I can do it. We've done it for 50 companies and I can easily handle it. And, I'll, and I could talk to the IT guys at their level, probably most, most of them beyond their level because they only do a little part of their business. So it, the most frustrating you thing is nobody, that, when you talked about learning how to code or learning how to write scripts and do these kind of things, how did you... How do you even know where to start in something technical like that? Since you didn't have any of that background from school, obviously. I mean, no, you didn't. I didn't. the only thing you took was English 101. Okay. Exactly. So <laughs> I, I bought a Unix computer and I couldn't afford a programmer. I bought a Unix based computer system and I didn't know what the VI editor was. I didn't know what, I didn't know what the Unix shell was. I knew nothing. So why'd you I buy got, the computer? Because it was a longer story, but I met with IBM. I met with these different vendors and IBM said, every time you grow, you have to change software. So the IBM 38 and the 36 and the AS 400, yeah. all the way, all had different platforms. It, it, Unix was object code compatible all the way up the line. Right. So I bought it, the next ve- version of the computer, faster, stronger. I just took my drives. And the, well, the, why did and you the, buy a computer to start with? Oh, okay. We we got an all right. because here you are. If you don't know what a computer does, right, right. You no, know. I wasn't that much of a, a a blockhead, but I was close. Okay, but, but you had your Apple II E. I forgot about the right. Apple II E. Right. Then I bought several Apple II E's, and then I was merging floppies while I'm having dinner and merging all the data. Floppy one, floppy two, floppy three, <laughs> floppy five, floppy two, because I I couldn't afford a second drive for four hundred pounds. <laughs> So I was the drive swapper. <laughs> but so I'm laughing so hard with, because I remember those days, okay? <laughs> so because we needed more computer power, I, I bought Unix based on object code compatibility. And guess what? That served me so well. I went through 
five AT&T computers and I switched to Sun and it took a day to recompile the C programs to work. So we never changed core software all the way up the line. We never changed. Uh, uh, the but we're talking software. about all of these successes, these this brilliance yeah. that you had, that you didn't just no, sit no. there. Well, no, you didn't just sit there and sort of the market sort of ran past you, okay? Because the fact that you were in the market, okay, and you weren't afraid to learn something new, you know, you, you identified problems early, you pivoted your business to meet those new problems, which was great. So that kept your customer base tied to you. You know, you make it sound like it was all just whew, straight up. What were the challenges that you were faced with here? How many? Tell how me some of the. Yeah, tell me some of the some of the ones well, that just sort of come to mind as you were building this business. All right. So, as you can tell, a guy that knows how to write and see, sell the business, do the IT at night, uh, answer the phones, is you, you can already see the problem. And I read a book. And called- you have a wife and kids. Yes. At the time. Uh, yep. Oh so, my God. The first seven years, literally, I, I woke up out of a dead sleep every night of my life. And I just had to. I didn't have the money. So these people that say, oh, I'm going to fail because I didn't get my my third C round or D round. I, I never. My story is probably different, probably like chips, different than most people. They're, they're, they raised a million. Now they want to raise seven million. And then I raised hundreds of dollars from friends and family. And somebody told me early on, if I didn't sell all the stock early, when I sell the company eventually, I'll be glad if I could. But it took me 40 years. A lot of these guys turned their companies in five or six years and what took me a generation. But so the net net is. um, Yeah. But the other side of that is, is that you had continually increasing income. Yeah. Okay. And ownership, majority ownership in the business. Okay. Versus so, I'm going to I'm going to reduce all my risk by just taking on a bunch of money, grow fast and sell out. And right. now I'm unemployed. Right. I mean. <laughs> yeah. So as you can see, I was doing everything. So I was not focused. I was a jack of all trades. My father owned a sewing plant. He's cutting cloth, delivering the goods, doing the payroll by hand. And I was my father just. He was running sewing machines and I was running computer terminals, but we were living the same life. Then I read a book called E-Myth, and it talks about a lot of people start businesses. They really start jobs for themselves on what they know how to do, and they never convert to a business. If I died, if my father died, his business stopped. If I died at that time, my business stopped because I was I was everything. So it was really holding our growth back. But it was keeping us alive because I wasn't spending. How did, you get, how did you get your hands on? Who recommended E Myth? I wish I knew because I need to thank that person. But they gave me that book, and, and I could see myself that I am E Myth personified. I now, that what is did they me. say? That I think the message was: is the the worst problem uh, when you when you start your own business, the biggest problem is is uh, you're 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 the only. What is it? What? How does it? Put it like I'm trying to remember now because I read that book and it really had an impact on me too. Is you're your own worst boss or something like that? Yeah. yeah right. the, 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 the opening story was this: the lady knew how to bake pies, and they said you should start a pie company. Yeah, and she did. And you come back 40 years later, and she's wiping the tables and putting the sign out and ro- rolling the dough. She never created a business; she created a a little bit of income around her skill of making pies. There you so, go. Okay. so then. So then I started to so bring in. How did in, that impact you? Well, I started to say, okay, I need to bring in more professionals. It was me and a bunch of CSRs, uh, customer service reps. I got so it. So then I started to hire, and I always felt like, God, I can't spend the money to how hire many, them. How many years was that? Because that is the that is very typical. the The entrepreneur organization chart is entrepreneur, everybody else, which is so where you were. Charlie, twenty years, maybe maybe twenty five years. Wow. Uh, just, I just was like my, I was a hamster in a cage. How, I was did just working ever, with, how did you keep a family? How did you live a life? How did you do anything but work? Well, we could talk later. I did all kinds of crazy things that most people don't, but <laughs> I, I, there was a period of time that literally I just worked and I had, I had to, I had family, kids, I had responsibility. I had, 
I had cash flow. So you, you, you asked what were some of the tough things we went through. Early on, I did payroll by hand and I did my payroll taxes. I'd have my check for the bank and I could I didn't get there before two o'clock before the thing closed. And I just got a twelve hundred dollar penalty because it was the third business day. This and is then, the deposit the withholding. The withholdings. And yeah, then, okay. Well, I missed the withholding. And then so I got into trouble with the IRS when the when the lady showed up my door knocking and she said, uh, show me her badge. You ever seen an IRS badge? It looks like No, I never did, thank God. Okay. <laughs> it's not what you want to see. <laughs> and so I got behind and she said they were gonna close me down. We're gonna close you down, sir. Sorry, you got until Friday. So I went back to her her office quietly she and i across the table this is that there was story. no discussion that was it she, they were shut me down by, if i didn't pay by friday and i could not pay no matter what okay so i, I went I, I think i brought as a it was a little bit of a prop i brought the plans of my house and i i went to her desk and i said hey i have a nice home and i'd be happy to you know, she said, we can get your house anyway. That's what she said. She, she, she took that. Not a I good marketing said, chip, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. That, that, that was worth it. So she said, you know, I said, I've been in business for, for seven years. I have all these employees. They're counting on me. I owe the government this money. I'm not disputing it. But if you shut me down, you won't get the money. My employees will lose their jobs. And it just doesn't seem to make sense. But if you will give me time every week, You'll, I'll owe you less. I'll be current, and the government will improve its situation every single week. And she said, "My father had a business. I know what you're struggling with." Now she was a bear standing at my door, but now she's a woman, a human being. And she said, "How much time do you need?" And I said, three years." <laughs> <laughs> she gave me three years. What was the amount? Me- do you remember? It wasn't big. It might have been 20000 or 30000 That's what I was thinking. It wasn't a huge it, number, right? It, it wasn't big. And her name was Deborah Daigle. I probably shouldn't say her name. She probably <laughs> retired by now. But I found out she was Catholic along the way. And when I wrote my last check, I sent her a, a Catholic mass card. And I said, you could have shut me down three years ago. The government is paid in full. I've never been late. Thank you very much. Here's a a little gift. Huh. And uh, so, sorry. I meant to I meant to tell you that I'm a pretty emotional guy. Yeah, but those are people that were they 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 made an impact on your life. She could have made good like that first meeting. I'm just shutting you down. Yeah, but again, she remember, Charlie. You. It's it's my belief if you sit across the table in a huh. quiet way with a sincere heart that literally very few people when it's reasonable will tell you no, very few. Now it takes humility and it takes, it takes to make the call, to make in the walk in the door. I remember going to uh, Birmingham, Alabama mm. and I needed about $400,000, 420. Four, I think I got 425. This is before the banking crisis. And this is when trust and honor was everything. And I, w- I, wa- I walked out of the bank with, with a check of what I needed from a kind son of a gun that I wrote him later. And I said, if you ever need anything or anybody you care about. How did about, you walk out with the four? How old, how old were you then when you were borrowing 400,000 bucks? I might have been 35 or so. And, so, and then you, did, and you had no collateral? Not, not that kind of collateral. So what well, are they, you know, back then, those were the days of collateral. Okay. Well, what well, was this? It? Was before Reese, what was it? Seven. Character, collateral, and capacity to pay. That was the three C's of banking back then. I don't know what they are now. Well, he knew that no matter what, I would figure out how to pay him. Huh. And he didn't take my stock. He didn't take my house. He just says, you might need that for other things. It was just how those did he moments. Know? What did he see in you? I think I'd known him earlier in life and he knew my family and he knew my brother. And okay. it was just one of those kindnesses. I can't tell you. It's like getting into boarding school when there was no room. He shouldn't have done it. He probably would get fired today 
in today's banking world, but he just had a gut that it would be okay. And he got paid back in full on time. And that's one of the, I, I could, Charlie, as you know, in 40 years, there's a hundred of those stories, but uh, that's the kind of thing I think. Let me just one more minute, if you don't mind. There's one more story that when I was about to sell the company, I tried to time the lease expiration with a new smaller lease so that the, the new buyer and I timed it too close and I couldn't make the switch. By the time they did all the lines and we would have missed, we had to be out of this space that we were in for 17 years and we would have missed, we would have been late in this call centers 24 7, 365. There is no shutting down for a week or a day. Yeah, right, right. So I, I went to the building manager that I've been in for 17 years and I said, I need another week. I mean, excuse me, I need another month. He said, impossible. The day you leave, we're pulling the site down. We're rebuilding. We're going to, this thing, will, it'll be blank by the end of the day. And I said, oh, I can't. I can't make my, I've had my business now for damn near 40 years. Uh, I, 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 you got to, you got to give me another month. No, you're not getting. Now, this is an intractable, intractable problem here. Okay. <laughs> so, no. So then I decided to go meet with uh, the guy that owns that building and many others is, and I went to his office and they wouldn't see me. They wouldn't see me because I wanted to sit down across the table and beg. Yeah. So I wrote him a letter and I said, Hey, I know you own many buildings and you don't have to do this, but somewhere along your life, Somebody must have been kind to you, not because they had to, just because they wanted to. And somebody must have been good to you or in some way did something for you you didn't deserve. I don't deserve this. But if you allow this to happen and you force me out without another month, I have 500 employees. I have 37 years at the time invested. It, 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 I, will, I will lose my business and I will lose my accounts. And I'm asking for 30 days. I know it screws your schedule up. I know you 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 bought this building and you're rehabbing it and you're doing, but I just got to have it. He wrote me back. So I'll give you a month. And that wasn't too long ago. That was just a few years ago. Now, I should have never gotten into all these crises. I own all the, all of pushing the needle too far, but Again, I, if I can tell any of your business guys that own a business, one thing, be honest, be forthright, be upfront, deal with the guy that makes the decision. Do what you say, no matter what, no matter if you don't have to eat for a month, do what you say. And people will work with you on your darkest day when you're in the shower and you're thinking, how am I going to get through this? It's just, it's, there's no way. It's impossible. How do I get through this? Keep your head. Think straight. To me, I have a pretty solid interior life, prayer life. I'm like, okay, Lord, uh, it's your call. I'm, I'm all in. Wow. I, I would say I've yet to be let down when I've been in that kind of position, but it's just, and you have to be an honest person. You, you can go through our company back. No one got screwed. Everyone eventually uh, got taken care of. And I was in trouble. So What's many interesting times. though, is that you never pulled the legal card, right? I mean, oh, no. another way to have handled that landlord is to just tied up the space by suing him for some random reason, okay, you know, just so that it would s just stop things for 30 days so that you could stay. You never pulled the legal card. You sort of accepted it as sort of arm's length business, forget contracts. It was really just me and you, right? Uh, yeah, I never had to pull the contract out of a drawer. I always felt like if I handle it well and handle it up front before, I, I had something 15, 20 years ago and I couldn't pay my rent that month or the next month or the next month. And I went to the owner of the building and I said, hey, I've been in your building for five years. I'm not going to be able to pay my next three months rent, but I'll do this and I'll do this and I'll do this. He said to me, any man that'll come to me 
before the problem happens with a plan is my kind of guy. You go out and tell Dolores what you need and she'll approve it. I said, thank you. But that is the way to do. I never, I've never uh, had to sue or be sued or it's just that it wasn't my cup of tea. I, I think you lose the minute you go to uh, to a uh, lawsuit over business. So were you, uh, so were you, 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 I love, I think God has certainly blessed you with um, very high interpersonal skills. Okay. I mean, you, you have a humility about you. I'm, I saw it when I first met you. It's authentic and uh, God given. And yet you have a, you, you use it as a way to kind of, to connect with people. You connected with the IRS agent. You connected with that building owner. You know, you connected with your landlord. You connect with these people. And you connected with even the executives of General Motors that you were standing in front of when you were a kid, right? I mean, that's a, that's an unusual gift for you to, to have. And uh, we don't see a lot of that gift being exercised these days because everything is an electronic interface, you know? Right. I send you an email to set up a meeting. Okay. I don't call you. I don't connect with you. And then I give you a presentation over Zoom. So we're never really in the same room. We're, so our humanity is sort of closeted almost, you know, and mm -hmm. uh, it's tough. So you've used that well. So how did, I noticed that you've done some other things that were like crazy, unusual things. Like you, you swam Alcatraz, you know, like how did, tell us a little bit about some of these things that you didn't just work all the time. You must've been in some pretty decent shape to do some of these extracurricular activities that gave you this even another dimension to your life. What were those about and how did they help you in, in being a better entrepreneur? Um, you know, I, I, uh, I wasn't watching my health. And so I decided to train and swim an event. Like, so I signed up for Alcatraz and I bought a 32 Speedo and hung it behind my office door. So no one else knew it was there. But I thought, you know what? I'm going to wear that Speedo. What is that? Out. A little swim team suit, a little, a little skimpy bikini. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so I trained and trained and trained. And then I went out and I swam Alcatraz. And it was it was really quite easy. I, How did I, I didn't even come up. Uh, I don't know. It was just like I've never is, known anybody who said, you know, I had an idea. I needed to get back. I needed to get in shape, so I decided yeah. to swim Alcatraz. I mean, how does that like happen? Well, I always like to have a little thing out there to focus on. Okay. So, and then I then I swam it three times uh, all told, and then I thought, well, what else could I do out there? Then I swam the Golden Gate Bridge three times. <laughs> And then, then I swam uh, the Chesapeake Bay Bridge, but I didn't finish. I was too old and slow. They only, <laughs> they only closed the bridge for so many hours. And they said, hey, you slow poke, jump in the boat. We got to open the bridge. <laughs> but, but How old were so, you when you did the Alcatraz swim the first time? The first time might have been 2008, maybe. Wow. And the, last time, the last time was about three years ago, I think. So yeah. you didn't do these things when you were 30. You did these things when you were in your late 40s, early 50s. It, 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 now I would say maybe it was mid-30s the first time. Okay. I've done eight, eight, eight events in San Francisco Bay. So that was – and then – Did you ever I, live out there? No, but I did a lot of business out there. So okay. I, I, I really liked it. Uh, and then I, then I really liked sailing, but I never had time because I was working for the last 25 years. And so I signed up. I said, you know what I want to do? I want to. I also saw a movie when I was 13 called I Sailed to Tahiti with an All-Girl Crew. And Gardner McKay was the uh, was the lead in that. And I, was, I think I saw it on TBS when I was 13 years old. <laughs> so I had a chance to uh, go to Tahiti, sail to Tahiti from New Zealand. And I signed up and I literally I sailed for a month on a little 46 foot sailboat with an, a, another group with a six others and we sailed to the Austral Islands and to Morea and then to Tahiti. Is that when you and, learned to sail by being on that boat? Uh, no, I learned to sail in, uh, in Charleston, South Carolina. Oh, they have and, classes there. Yeah. Don't they? Yeah. And I learned and, you know, then I started going down to Hilton head and then going, you know, doing little trips. 
and now I've, you know, I've crossed the Atlantic. I've, uh, I've sailed to Tahiti again from San Diego. Uh, I've sailed from, uh, like by yourself. No, with, 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 with other, with other groups. Sometimes I was a captain. I did a uh, Fajardo, Puerto Rico to St. Augustine. I was a skipper on that. Uh, yeah, but these, from, aren't, uh, these aren't on like 12 foot boats or something. You don't, no, no, no. this isn't somewhere like between, Guinness book of world record stuff. Somewhere between 46 feet and 50 feet. Oh, okay. 50, good. All right. yeah, so these pretty, are true sea worthy boats. Oh, oh, absolutely. I'm not, yeah. I'm not, an idiot. I'm not, I'm not crazy. So <laughs> I, in my work life, I've been able to do some fun things along the way that are fairly unusual, but uh, I've really enjoyed them. And today I, I, my wife and I have a place down in St. Augustine and we can see the boat from the sliding glass window. And I get to go out on the ocean on a boat that I actually share with, with some other folks in a managed program, but it's, it's really quite fun, Charlie. And I also appreciate you inviting me and Kathy down there to kind of join you Please. for this, Jeff. I, I was excited to, to hear that when we sent this uh, call up. You would, you'll, you would love it. Yeah. Well, spending time with you and Frank would be a delight. I know that. And I've never met Ellen, never met your wife. So I don't know. <laughs> the Margaret, Mar my wife is Margaret. She, you, you would love them too as well. All right. Sure. This would be great. I look forward to it. So tell me, the other thing is when I went to visit you in your business, you... um you walked me around the company and I said in the introduction, you know, I was really taken by how the personal relationship you had with your CSRs, you know, you just never lost that no matter how big that you've got. And uh, the other thing you did is you, you, uh, you walked me into a chapel, <laughs> you know, can you tell us, uh, tell me a little bit about, it's sort of like your faith didn't play in your business for a while. And then all of a sudden it became a very visible part of your business. That's a big transition. How did all that happen? Well, as a Catholic, we don't really stand on the street corner and bang a drum for Jesus. We're, it's more and modest. Then, uh, Catholic, things, uh, Catholics aren't known for evangelism. That's true. Right. Yeah. So right. we're kind of quiet. So I never thought it was appropriate to talk faith in the office or, you know, because we have, at 500 people, you know, you have everything in the world. You have Muslims and and Buddhists and Baptists and soup to nuts. But I, I read a book that was given to me by a Catholic priest. It was called The Business Card by Peter Freisel. And Peter is a friend of mine now. And it's about bringing Christ into the workplace. Mm. And the name of his nonprofit is called His Way at Work. And okay. His Way at Work is about... Uh, visibly bringing Christ in the workplace. And, and our, our uh, president, my friend Dennis, uh, I read half the book and gave it to him. He read half and he said, I love this. So together we were united in bringing his when, way. At when work. Did that, why did you not? How long, well, first of all, how far in, how long were you in business before this thing, this came up? 30, it's, this has been the last seven or eight years. Okay, so you're 30 something years in business. Yeah. Okay, you're a lifelong Catholic, right. and then somebody drops this, this priest drops this book on you. Why didn't you say, you know, my faith is private. I'm a good Catholic. We don't need this. Okay, I don't believe uh, this. Why did it resonate with you? Well, now. Because a lot of people just do that. They just like, nah, yeah. that's, that's, that, those guys are a little wacky. Well, <laughs> if I got the book from somewhat stranger i would have i wouldn't have opened it and i would have been on the bookshelf okay but because a friend of mine who's a catholic priest gave it to me i kind of got this seal of good housekeeping seal that it was that it was really something i should consider and look so at. this is somebody who's credible in this Fair area credible. giving you this book great That's all right. right personal credibility so then what happened was the pe the guy that wrote the book was coming to atlanta and giving a talk and I sat in on the talk and I was like low hanging fruit. So as I heard his message and why he's doing what he's doing, and basically it's this, uh, you spend more of your day in at work than you do in the church. Yeah. And that you can make your workplace a visible place. So part of this Finish program. That sentence. Is, you can uh, make your workplace a visible place. Place for God in your life. Okay. In, in, where you go to work can be it. Uh, a big part of a spiritual journey. So the, the the guy that wrote the book really connected with me. And so I um, 
part of his process is he, you bring in corporate chaplains or some kind of chaplaincy. And I'm just like, wait a second, a chaplain in the workplace? And it was about 60000 a year in cost. And it was, you know, there's, and then you create a caring committee. And basically, I, 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 if I start talking about this, I'll cry again. But I just adopted it blindly saying, let's, my Dennis and I together were, and, and our company embraced it. So we put a chat, as, as you said, as you come in the entrance of the building into our lobby, there was a chapel right off the, the lobby. And it, 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 it had a little altar and had prayer books and it had seats to, and some of our employees would, on their breaks, would go into the chapel. And, how did uh, you, when you started this whole thing, how did you, it's one thing for you and your partner to go, yeah, we're all in. This is really great. How do you take that into the workplace? So I mean, that's huge we, because I'm sitting yeah. there, I'm a CSR. I've been here for 10 years and now all of a sudden, what? Well, well, Dennis, actually, we started to kind of relook at our mission and our purpose, and we started to put on our business cards, um, faith, stewardship, those those ideals, and printing them right on the business card. And that's what got the priest's Why? attention. Why? Just that we wanted to say that 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 God is part of our life and our company, and that. Why? Just to, and I was kind of embarrassed for 35 years. I never, that wasn't, that wasn't the case. Right. But right. kind of, you grow into it and, and the ownership of, I'm taught all these people's lives that are coming through my company and I'm not, they're not providing any kind of spiritual connection to them. So, so what, what I'm hearing from you in, in answer to my why that you're not answering directly, what I'm hearing from you is because I just knew it was the right thing to do. Like, like in your soul kind of knew, convicted, heart of right. hearts thing. That's what happened. And, and I can tell, yes. And I can tell you a little bit of how that manifested itself. So we had many employees that have many issues. And, and when we had 20 people, I knew all 20 and I could look you in the hallway and I knew there was something going on and I could say, Hey, what's up? Why don't, why don't you want to talk about it? But when you get 500 people on three shifts in two different offices or three different offices, then all of it, you, you can't be everywhere and you don't know half of what's going on. So what, what a chaplain was able to do for the company is they're roaming the hallways and they're meeting with people. And the chaplain introduced the whole concept of this by saying, we don't care if you're Baptist or Buddhist or Catholic or charismatic or Muslim or Methodist. We're here to love you like Christ would love you. and. So the first night that we got a chaplain, I, I sat through all the little meetings in both offices. We had two offices at the time and we met with everybody. And he gave out his card. He says, you can call me anytime. And I'm here to love you. Let Christ know. Formal you. rollout. Formal rollout. Okay. And that night he gets a phone call that somebody's child was visiting one of our employees and a TV fell and killed the baby. Now, uh, Before, hey, hey no, what company's prepared to respond to that? But we had a chaplain now, and the chaplain met with the family and, and, and offered that he called me and said, Would the company help fund the funeral or whatever, the little baby funeral? We said, Absolutely. But without that, I probably would have never heard about it, except tangentially that this had happened. But because our chaplain was foremost and forefront, right in the front, we were able to kind of put our arms around that that family through the company and be able to contribute in a way. If you don't mind, I'll tell you a, a couple other. Chaplain came to my office one day and he said, hey, do you have a minute to meet with someone? And I said, sure. And there, there was a lady, a lovely lady, that was basically in her queue taking her calls. And the night before, her father was, her father died because he owned some kind of club and there was a robbery and the grandson was at the door and the grandson was shot. That was her son. The father had a heart attack. His grandfather, you know, had a heart attack and died. And she's in her cube taking calls. And I didn't know that. I would have never known that. But the chaplain said, so I was able to say, go home, bury your father, be with your son that's still in, at the hospital. But 
that's where a chaplain brought it forward so that we could respond as a company. So you invited personal, what happened personally in people's lives into the business, which is extraordinarily unusual for any business, right? Just like you say, faith is, is one is Sunday and the rest of the week is work. Okay. That's and the other thing we say is your personal life's your personal life. When you come to work, you're working. Okay. And you blended all that together. You froze up on me. So with this faith in the office, you know, you talked about that there were, we have this blending of personal lives and faith and business all coming together. Okay. Which is very unusual in the office in any workplace. The thing that you talked about was there were all these different um, nationalities, all of these different religions, right? To no religions. You know, right. did you not got did you not experience pushback by having this chaplain or this room dedicated called a chapel in the business? You know, Charlie, we didn't. Uh, I was expect I was anticipating some. Okay, but we, we didn't because we weren't pushing it. Like, look, we just wanted to care about people in the way Christ would. Mm-hmm. So the the caring committee would take care of families. So somebody would come and say, we, the pipe broke in our house and we got wet carpet and we can't afford the deductible. And the caring committee would write a check to the employee, either a loan or, or a gift. So you had the chaplain and you had a caring committee? And the caring committee took care of people. Were they, just in, were they part of the peers of the employee base? Uh, they were anybody, any employee could come forward with a request. And but then who was on the caring committee? Oh, it was a group of depart from department. We we had okay employees from every department, and and I thought initially, God, they might give away the store. <laughs> but, but you know what? Uh, somebody from management would sit in on the caring committees, and I would I've sat on a, on a number of them, and uh, I had to say, you know what? Maybe you should give her the whole amount she wants. Because that's not going to solve the problem. I so I found myself that our people weren't overly giving out money like it was Christmas, but were listening carefully to everyone's problem. And well, the chaplain said he told her to go here and here and here for aid, and she never went, or she just got a loan two months ago for something else. And they were they treated the money of the company like it was gold bricks, Isn't and they so- never. Never once were they frivolous or. And you they, never they got you never got sued. You never got somebody that stood you up, uh, came in your office about b- speaking about Jesus or anything like that. Just never. Because, because you weren't really. It wasn't evangelical in that. It was really more serving the employees. That's right. So if, if the chaplain came up to your desk and you didn't want to talk, no problem. He, okay. He's not here to push himself on you. But he would uncover so many hidden needs. But the employees didn't feel like it was a condition of employment to be a part of all that. I never once felt anyone come to me or suggest to me that it was offensive or that it was. uh, And and that was one of my concerns. And uh, also, I didn't want to start a program that failed. And like, who are you to talk about Jesus? And and I was worried about all those things. And who who am I to even say suggest this? But because it was a program created by His Way at Work, they kind of and they let us go up to their South Carolina office and sit in on their caring committees and talk to their caring oh, manager. Okay. And so there was a smooth handoff on. We were just a replication side of what they were doing right. already. There was a but model all, for it. It wasn't something that the, yeah that you knew yeah. worked. And they've they, so if you had some issue come up, you could always ask them, and they could tell you this is what happened at other businesses where we are and all. I make sense. I was going to say is, so that's really interesting. And, you know, it, it all sounds like everything was just going along famously. Okay. So now you brought in this, the, you bring in this faith, com- your faith component into the business. It's working well. The business is growing. I got all of these iconic brands that I'm working with. Yet when I met you, one of the things that came up was, uh, you had gotten yourself into cash problem, into a cash fix. What happened? 
How could you be in yeah. business that long and then something like well, cash we, we, be sort of an issue, if you will? I mean, how did that happen? Well, we, we started to grow and I think we hit 20 million <clears throat> revenue. And I started to spend more time away and we hired professionals. And we had a $3,000 corporate apartment for, for our CFO when he would come in. We had we bought a million dollars worth of equipment. And I remember sitting in on the meeting and say, can we afford this? You know, cause I always accounted for every penny. I, yeah. we, we didn't grow fast, but I was very, very careful. I, I can kind of, and we just kind of, we made more money at, at 8 million in revenue than we did at 20 million in revenue. And so then our exposure became. So why did different. you, why did you get into this? I brought in the professionals as you called it, you know, when, what prompted that move? And when to, you brought them in, the other thing you're telling me is you stood back and said, well, I hired them. They're good, smart people. They should just run it, right? Right. So probably a lot of people go through this. And, and uh, I... People do. And that's why I'm asking this question, yeah, okay? Yeah. Uh, I kind of let... I was 30-something years, 35 or six years. I kind of wanted to step away. Not, a, I wasn't exhausted, but I was... I have this management team. I'm no no you longer were in EMS. business for 35 years. You weren't yes. 35 years old. No, no, third business for 35 years. Right. Okay. Go ahead. I'm, I'm, I'm no longer e myth. I'm not saddled by me having to do everything, and I'm bringing in these professionals. And some of them were making more than me. Uh, some of them were. Uh, we made an acquisition of a company, and we didn't keep a lot of that business. It was a, a little bit different business, slightly. Yeah. And we, so. Through my own fault, because I didn't manage well, I kind of let go management, you know what I mean? Versus I wasn't looking at the books and records and looking. I could feel that we were we were we weren't doing well. But then we got to a point where we just we we, we ballooned up in costs and we weren't really watching the pennies. And so my thing to say to any business person is don't it's it's a, it's what you keep it's not necessarily how big i top line revenue was my focus let's let's grow the top line revenue and and we helped achieve some of that through an acquisition but we did not manage our costs we did not how we didn't cash, how much cash did you go through during that time um hundreds of thousands of dollars uh, but you also took out loans did you not yeah, we, we got a uh, SBA loan for a million dollars, and okay. that was pretty much drawn down on. Um, so we just were we were too small to be big, but too big to be small. You know, we we were in no man's land. We were we had all of this all this infrastructure, and we had all these people. And I, frankly, I wasn't growing the sales fast enough to keep up with that. Yeah, and I really should lose, have. Did you lose? Uh, did the sales not con like you said? I wasn't keeping up with the sales to keep growing them. Is it because you know there's not a lot of people that I talk to that have been in business for forty years? Okay, same business. All right. Do you get to a point? This is the one that I want to investigate. Is do you get to the point where you just you do get tired? Yeah, I, I was tired. I was tired, but I also felt like again, sorry about that noise. Uh, I felt like that uh, if I hired these folks and they're professionals, older, you know, in some cases, that uh, that I should be able to be a chairman, so to speak, and not be in the day to day in the blocking and tackling. And I, I, I pulled away and I didn't manage as I pulled away. Well, you didn't hold them accountable either. It's one thing to pull away to, for operationally. It's another thing right. to pull away from an accountability standpoint. So you were basically an absent chairman, in effect, almost. I, I, I was. And we had two folks that were at the top that were not necessarily uh, jiving and that yin and yang. But uh, yeah, at the end of the day, it was my company and my name on the door. My, I should have never done what I did. But I did, and so we got into a cash flow uh, situation that you. How that did you, you not lose? How did you not lose the company? Well, I never thought I would. First of all, as you can imagine, through all these stories, uh, and I yeah, just but started you get to, to a point like that where you're out of cash, and you got infighting, and you've been out of the business. I mean, that's a formula for poof, it's gone. 
Okay. Well, you know, th- there was a point. How did, you, which, how did you work your way out of it? That's all I'm asking. Yeah. So there was a point at which my uh, my management team says, you're not paying attention of how how tough things are and we should file bankruptcy and all, all those discussions. I'm like, no, I'm not going to do that. We'll, we'll figure our way out. And I started meeting with, with uh, companies. I met with about five or six different companies. And, uh, and one of them gave us an opportunity to, uh, to, to sell the business, get an infusion of capital and be, if we could grow it some more that participate in that growth. And okay. so the, the exit was structured in that, uh, with some more growth, um, there was this amount, but with more growth, there was X, X plus. And, and when uh, they it came was, in, they must have rationalized the expense base to get rid of a lot of stuff so that yeah, it, right. so that the growth, any growth was going to actually be very profitable. Did that bring right. you they, back into the business to create that growth? Uh, yeah. It, on the outside, I was no longer in the operations or the, but but I I did remain on as uh, driving some new business and, and some of the business was pretty healthy pretty 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 large pieces of business um, and but I didn't have any other I didn't have any other responsibility. What's did that? You, did you bring that big business in? You yes. did personally. Yeah, that that was my my role then was to uh, to bring in. Some That's new what business. I'm saying. So you came back in back in your proven sales role that you had all your life. Right. And so you were in your sweet spot again, and you were making these calls, doing presentations and closing business. Yeah. It, it, but I couldn't make the decision on pricing and I couldn't. So I brought in probably four times as much opportunity to the table and we didn't win a lot of it uh, because different, different. Uh, I, all I was the guy to bring it to the door and make the presentation. And yeah. then it would come yeah. down to another group that would price it. In the early on, the first year or so, uh, lots of opportunities came in. And some of them were much larger than we could handle. Big, huge opportunities that we declined. But uh, what could you, you, what would you, what would you have done different so that you didn't find yourself in this situation in these last five years that you've been through? I don't know that I had the oomph, the, they ran it like a business immediately. So people that I was carrying for a while got chopped. Lots of people, a lot of heavy management went away. And these are some of these people that worked for me for 20 something years. Of the, so you're one of your biggest strengths, obviously. And I wrote, wrote this down was that how valuable, how much value there was in your, the depth of your relationships. So that very one strength could also be something that could, be a great hindrance for you, which it turned out to be. It, it, it was. I, I didn't run it like a EBITDA driven business. I ran it like a family. And then also, and then there were people that would, would look at me and say, well, you weren't working as hard as you did 20 years ago. And I, and I wasn't, I wasn't. So a lot of it came down to me, but uh, I, I couldn't make the decisions that they made the, they made the proper business decisions, and I don't think I had the capacity to do those. It was it just wasn't. I I basically fed my family for forty years, had a lot of fun along the way, ended up with seventy uh, percent uh, of the stock, uh, actually probably seventy five percent of the stock, and was able to have a have a have a nice exit. I was happy with, but I I didn't have. I I was a great asset and a great liability all rolled up in one guy. Yeah. And and I would have been better off. That was to- interesting. I think that this has also happened to me is I always felt like uh as I looked back, I was a much better investor from forty to fifty-five to maybe even sixty. Uh I wouldn't even go that far. I'd say late fifties, uh, by far than I was for these last ten years. Okay. I've changed. I don't have that edge, okay, <laughs> that I had, whether it's the motivation or also the making the tough decisions. You know, you kind of all of a sudden I found myself backing up on things and ah, it'll work out. It'll work out. And those, if you're in an operating business like you are, which uh, you, that's those, that kind of attitude can cost lots and lots of cash. 
you know, so I see where you're coming from. I don't think it's unusual. And I think it's something that people need to know when you lose that. What was it in one of the Rocky movies? Was it Rocky II, the eye of the tiger? Right. You know, he didn't have the eye of the tiger. You got to get the eye of the tiger back. And I think we get older, we lose that. Some of us. Okay. And so I'm not blaming anyone for what happened in my company mm-hmm. other than me. Truly, yeah, I'm not. I get that. I mean, I can spot some things that were changes I should have made that I didn't. But I just didn't, you know, it, it was time. You know, every dog has its day. And nothing, <laughs> nothing lasts forever. And it, it was time for new, fresh leadership to run the business we'd got. And like you said before, we, we had some iconic brands. For, I mean, very household name brands. That uh, that we were able to win along the way. Well, how do you? Yeah. How do you? I mean, you did a. I mean, you lived a wonderful business life, a wonderful personal life. You did some outstanding things. Your swims from Alcatraz and all that. I'm sorry, the Chesapeake bid, uh, Bridge thing didn't work out for you, <laughs> and they <laughs> got to pull the old guy out of the water. But uh, how do you? So then you cash out. You finally get to the point where you cash out, and then you kind of a thrust. Now you're not doing. Are you, do you stop doing it all together or have you, uh, are you into something new or what? Well, I, I, as a consultant, I'm, I'm uh, looking to uh, continue to sell for the business because that's something I can do and earn my burn rate, so to speak. Uh, and, so you're uh, still do, in the business in effect well, as a consultant. Yeah, uh, though. yeah I, I've taken, I've taken a little bit of time here since the, since the, uh, since the clo- my, my closing of the active participation and I've talked to the, uh, the new owners and they said, yes, they would be glad to have me uh, work on a consultant basis, you know, commission basis. So you're so 100% I, 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 plan, I, I plan to do that. Also sailing and do a little uh, maybe charter business or something with, with sailing involved, possibly if, if, if it's, if my wife will support being a boat widow, so to speak. Yeah. Um, so you're so you're really looking to you're in the you're currently actively transitioning. Yeah, you know, I am. from the yeah. business into uh, what I call sort of almost a retirement type business. Okay, something that's not the business you were in. Right. But right. not so, probably you're not looking to grow a charter business either. You know, that's not really. Just, right. just maybe maybe cover burn rate. And that, and that would be ample for what I'm okay. thinking about. But it's, it, you know, it's like anything else. You, uh, I, I don't know what tomorrow brings. I am on the board of His Way at Work. And uh, I, I like participating in that in that um, the, the guys involved and participating in that charity. And, and I'm still looking at, OK, I'm only 60 now. You know, I assume I'll live till mid eighties or maybe not. My mother was 93 and uh, look, looking at, uh, um, at, at the few, Charlie, can I add one other thing? Just, just very quickly. Yeah, sure. Yeah. We, we were talking about his way at work and all the things that we were doing for employees. And someone said to me, well, what's the ROI on that? And I said, what's the ROI of, of touching people's lives and, 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 and really making a difference. And I said, well, here's one thing I could point to. I had to take pay cuts about, I don't know, leading up to this problem uh, in the last five, six, seven years. Uh, and I had to ask for pay cuts from every employee. These are 10 or $12 an hour. And I'm taking a dollar an hour, 10% pay cut, all the employees. And so I braced myself for a huge, a huge exodus. I met in small groups in both centers and like little groups of six or seven and told, told them face to face that this was going to happen. And we had to do it as long as it took to kind of right the ship. Well, I also had an, a, cl- a client that bankrupted for 180,000. Part of that cash flow problem was that another one bankrupted for 50,000 small retailers. And so all of that contributed to this. And uh, to a person, I met with these small groups and I was expecting you know, dozen or two people to quit. I, I don't know of anyone that quit. In these meetings, tears, hugs for me. When I was in trouble, the company helped me. I got six kids. I don't know how I'm going to do it, but I'll figure it out. So here I was in these meetings with people that could just leave because none of them were high comps, really. Yeah. I mean, they could just walk out the door. 
And because I think the company had that giving mentality, so to speak, um, that it came back to us. I think it's because that company cared about them, genuinely cared about them. That's different than just a giving mentality. That's really, that's that's uh, being a human being to um, to each other. Okay, that's hard to do. That's See, Christ so, at work right there. It was, and so it, it was. I was out of tears by the end of the night uh, after all the meetings because <laughs> everybody was very supportive, and uh, so so you not every company. You talk about a legacy. You built a company where people really loved each other. I think so. That is an incredible legacy and an incredible feat, even bigger than finishing your swim at the Chesapeake Bridge, okay? <laughs> I think you did pretty good. Well done, good and faithful servant. That's what Christ is going to be telling you <laughs> for sure. I hope so. God Thank bless you, you, my friend. This has you been uh, an amazing time together. I really appreciate you. And uh, I love your brother too, by the way, Frank. He's a, he's a gem in our community, no doubt about it. He, he really enjoys it, Charlie. All right. And as you know, any business, there's hundreds, if not thousands of people that contributed to make it work. And there's just too many today. But I, over 40 years, there's been many, many hundreds and hundreds of people that were, were all part of this. So. I'm grateful to all of them. Well, thank you so much. I'm going to close this out now. Thank God you, Charlie. bless you, my friend. And I look forward to our sailboat trip. I'm, I'm going to be down there, St. Augustine. You name the time and I'm ready. All right. Take care. Let me close Charlie. this. Thanks. Bye-bye. Well, thank you, everybody, for joining uh, me and Marty Ty on the Charlie Paparelli Show. Boy, there's something to be learned here, as there is from other entrepreneurs, but but I think Marty brings something to the table that's truly um, unique that we all know is right, but sometimes we get so business-oriented that we don't do what is right, and that is just love one another. I mean, he, 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 he said there's nothing that can't be achieved by sitting across the table from somebody and just sharing your lives with each other and sharing your problems with each other and asking for help. And uh, that's, that's one of the greatest lessons you could ever learn in life and in business. So thanks for joining. Please subscribe at paparelli.com. And I look forward to seeing you next time. Bye-bye.